This message was recorded on Sunday morning, May 27, 1973, at Forest Hills Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia. Open your Bible this morning to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews, chapter 11. And I want to share several verses, beginning with verse 8. Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she had judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude, and as the sands which is by the seashore innumerable. Let's bow our heads for prayer. And now, Heavenly Father, in these next moments together, we pray that Thou wouldst speak to our hearts. I pray this morning that I'll say exactly what you want me to say, that I'll say it in the exact manner you'd have me to say it. I want to be a blessing. I want to be a help. And I pray this morning that uh, the people will listen. I pray that every young person will listen this morning and that uh, they'll be challenged to be different, to know a superior way of life, to be willing to obey the call of God in a matter of separation. Speak to hearts now across this room, and I'll thank thee for it, because I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. It costs nothing to be saved, but it costs an awful lot to be a good Christian. I say it costs nothing to be saved. I mean by that it costs you nothing. There's a high cost involved, but the cost is already paid. Jesus paid it all 2,000 years ago. But to be a real servant, a real Christian, it costs something. I read this morning about Abraham, who was called of God to leave his country and his kinfolks and to go out into a country not knowing whether he was going. And the Bible says, by faith he obeyed God, not knowing where he was going. He just went. It meant separation for Abraham. And so I want to speak this morning on God's call to separation. A man can be saved without being separated. He's saved on the merit of what Christ did for him. But he cannot be a good Christian without being separated. He cannot be a happy Christian. And he certainly cannot be a useful Christian without being a separated Christian. Just a word about separation before I talk about God's call to Abraham. Most of the sermons you hear on separation have to do with what we are separated from. For instance, they'll say you ought to be separated from the world. They'll quote verses like Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 and following, where Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to the world. That is, don't be in harmony with the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. They'll quote such passages as a passage in 2 Corinthians six seventeen, which says, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not. And handle not the unclean thing. They'll say we should not have bad habits, and they're correct. They'll say we ought to dress modest, and that's correct. They're saying we ought to live good, clean, separated, dedicated lives. But if your emphasis in the matter of separation is only on what you're separated from, then you've missed the main part of separation. Because the Bible emphasis is on what you're separated to. A very interesting expression is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And I'd have you remember that last expression, separated unto the gospel of God. You notice Paul does not put the emphasis on what he's separated from, but he put the emphasis upon what he's separated to. It's the task we're called to perform that demands our separation from the world. Separation from the world for the sake of saying I'm separated from the world is no good. But separation from the world for the sake of service is good separation. 
If you dress like you dress just for the sake of saying, I don't dress like other folks, then that's no good. But if you do it for the sake of your testimony, so that you can be a more effective witness, that's good. If you don't go to certain places that other unsaved people go to, just for the sake of saying, I belong to a fundamental church and I'm separated, that's no good. But if you do it to improve your testimony, to demand the respect of unsaved people in your community, to show them that you have a superior way of life, then that's good separation. It's what you're separated to. This same idea is brought out in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. When the Paul starts off by saying, Wherefore sin we compassed about with such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight, uh, uh, and every sin, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily doth beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I think the emphasis in those two or three verses is not on laying aside the weights. I do not think the emphasis is on laying aside the sin which easily doth beset you. I think the important part of those two or three verses is running the race that is set before you. The other is a means to an end. The means, laying aside the weights, laying aside the sins, and so on, that you may run a good race. That's the importance of it. Suppose a fellow is on the track team at the high school, and he runs a hundred-yard dash, or maybe the full 40. And he gets ready to run the, the race. And somebody said, now, we want to make sure you do it right. Make sure you lay aside every weight now. You got on shoes that are too heavy. Get on lighter shoes. Uh, you got on too much clothing. You shouldn't run a foot race and, and bib overalls. Take some of that clothing off. Get some shorts on where you can get better leg movement. Lay aside every weight. You don't need such and such on. Let's get, let's get down to the bare necessities and so so you can run the weights with patience and do a good job. So let's suppose he spends all his time then laying aside the heavy brogan shoes and the bib overalls and all the other. But that's all he does is lay aside all the weights and he never runs a race. He may as well kept on his brogan shoes. He may as well kept on his bib overalls because the whole purpose of laying aside the weights was to run the race. And the whole purpose in the matter of Christian dress and the matter of Christian living and the matter of keeping your life clean and not having bad habits. The whole purpose of it is, is what you are separated unto. What, not what you are separated from, but you lay all this aside that you may be a better Christian, a more effective witness, that you may do a better job as a Sunday school teacher, as a bus driver, as a bus captain, as a choir member. The whole purpose of choir members wearing dresses at decent length is so people have confidence in you when you're seen and not think you're somebody off the street somewhere. They'll think you're a born-again believer. They'll, they'll be impressed with the way you dress, and they'll be willing and ready to hear you sing if you dress properly. But the whole purpose is, is to service. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of Christ. Now I would like to think that I live a fairly good Christian life. I'm not an expert. You know, I could still go to heaven and smoke if I wanted to. I could still go to heaven and chew if I wanted to. I could go to heaven if I only went to church about once a month. I could still go to heaven. I could still go to heaven if I never read my Bible, just occasionally read it, and very seldom prayed. I could still go to heaven because these are not the prerequisites for salvation. The prerequisites for salvation is faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But I don't think I could be a good servant. I don't think I could be a good father, a good Christian. I don't think I could be a good husband unless, unless I spent time in the Bible reading, unless I tried to live a separated life. I don't think I could be a good pastor. I'm sure that if I was a layman in the average church and the pastor had no standards and the pastor did not live a separated life, I wouldn't have any confidence in what he had to say. The whole purpose of my separation is that I may serve the Lord. Paul said, I'm separated unto the gospel. Now, God called Abraham to a life of separation. You'll find it in Genesis chapter 12. He told him to leave the land of Arab Chaldees. He says, you go now, and I'll make you a blessing. And through thy seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Notice, first of all, the call to separation. Several things about it. Number one, it was a personal call. God said to Abraham, 
Abraham, I want you to leave the land of Arab Chaldees. Abraham could have said, well, what about uh, Lot? And what about uh, my father and my mother? And what about the others? But God has spoken to Abraham. It was a personal thing with Abraham. You see, in my own life, the question is not, what are other people doing in other churches? And the question is not, is every preacher that God called a separated preacher, does he live clean and separated? That's not the question. The question is this, God's called me. I know I'm, I'm a little different. I'm not saying I'm better, but I know I'm different at least. It may mean bad, I don't know. But I know every preacher in town doesn't preach like I do, and, and I know they don't take the same stand I take on issues, and I know that. But I'm not going to answer for every preacher in town. I'm going to answer for myself. You see, I'm not in the ministry because I sat down one day and took a sheet of paper, and on that sheet of paper were 25 choices of what I'd spend my life doing, and I looked the sheet over and I decided I'd be a preacher. That's not why I'm in the ministry. I'm in the ministry because I've had a call of God to enter the ministry. And the call of God to the ministry is as real to me as my right hand. I know as well the night God called me to preach as I do the night that I was married. And my call to preach is just as real to me as, as my own wedding. I'll never forget it. I walked in the yard that night. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I was still walking. And I remember kneeling beside the house, a little white five-room house. I remember kneeling there over a butane gas tank that was buried just beneath me. I remember it so well. And I said, yes, dear Lord, if you want me to be a preacher, I'll be a preacher. I don't see why you'd call me, but if you want me to preach, be a preacher, I'll be a preacher. And I won't be just the average preacher. I'll be different. I'll put my whole life into the ministry. I won't be a part-time preacher. I'll be a full-time preacher. If you want me to be a preacher, you can have me. But I want to be the very best preacher I can possibly be. I don't want to be satisfied to be just the average. I want to be the best. And I could see then there are some things that I shouldn't do. It's a personal call to separation. Not every Christian separated. I can't answer for John Reynolds, but John Stansel, or Brother Oveling, or, or anyone else here. But I'll have to answer for myself. God called me. If the whole world goes modernistic, if the whole world joins in the ecumenical movement, I cannot do it. If everybody in the world turns it back against me, I cannot compromise my Christian principles and go along for the sake of saving friends. If it means losing every friend I've got, I must stand by my Christian principles. I must maintain a life of separation. I cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers anywhere, at any time, in any kind of an effort. I cannot. I must die first, and many will misunderstand it. But the Bible said, don't do it. It's a personal call. I can't answer for other folks who claim to be fundamentalists. I can answer for myself. I can answer for other folks who claim to love God and love souls. I can answer for myself. God called me to a life of separation. It's a personal call. Abraham, he said, I want you to go. Secondly, it's a practical call. God never asks you to do anything that's not practical or reasonable. When Paul pled with the people at Rome to dedicate their bodies a living sacrifice, he said, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable. And Paul, I think, explains why it is reasonable when he says, I beseech you, brethren, in view of all God's mercies, in view of all that God has done for you, the mercies of God. It's by the mercies of God that I have health this morning. It's by the mercies of God that I have lungs that can inhale air and breathe. It's by the mercies of God that I am where I am. When I was a little boy, I never thought I'd enjoy things that I enjoy today. I never dreamed of having a new automobile. I never dreamed of having a house with two bathrooms in it. That was far beyond my furthest dream. Well, I'd have been satisfied to live in a little two-room house like I was raised in, or later to a three-room house. That would have been a wonderful thing for me. I never thought I'd get that far along. 
I thought my daddy was much smarter than I'd ever be. And, and if he couldn't do any better than that, I surely couldn't do any better. In view of all God's mercies, your health, your education, the fact that by the mercies of God you were born in the United States of America, a free country, a country where you can go to church or stay at home, a country where you can uh, get out and show initiative and, and make well in the business world and make as much as you want to make. Well, you could have been born in another country. You could have been born where people are poverty-stricken. You could have been born in Haiti where the per capita income is $4 a year. A year, not a week or month, a year. And yet you were born here and God has blessed you with everything you have. And Paul holds all this over your head and says, I plead with you, brethren, in view of all God's mercies, that you present to God your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. And don't be conformed to the world. Be separated, he said. Be different. Don't be like the world. It's a practical thing. It's a reasonable thing. Why, if God asked us to cut our right arm off, that wouldn't be unreasonable. If God had said, I want you to sacrifice your babies, that wouldn't be unreasonable. It's certainly not unreasonable for God to ask us to be good, dedicated, separated Christians and not live and dress and act and talk like the world. It's only reasonable to expect us to live right. And when you're rightly related to Christ, it's a strange thing. But when you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, it doesn't go against the grain with you. When you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, you find yourself wanting to live this kind of a life, and you find yourself living a separated life, not because the Bible demands it, but because you want to live that way. Uncle Buddy Robinson, the tongue-tied Nazarene preacher, went to New York, and someone took him out after the service and showed him all the sights of New York City, the bright lights. Uncle Bud went back to his room that night in his hotel and knelt down. And beside his bed, he prayed a little prayer, something like this. He said, Dear Lord, I thank Thee for all the beautiful sights of New York City. But he said, Most of all, Lord, he said, I thank Thee that I didn't see anything that I wanted. It was that easy with Uncle Bud. And when you are yielded to the Holy Spirit and when you love God and love the Bible and stay in the Bible and stay on your knees in prayer and walk with God day in and day out, seven days a week, you find yourself wanting to live like the Bible asks you to live. It's not a hard thing for you. It's an easy thing. It's not only a personal call and a practical call, but thirdly, it's a performable call. I quote Dr. Bob Jones Sr. an awful lot. You may be interested to know I never met Dr. Bob Jones Sr. personally. I never shook his hand. A lot of folks hear me quote him. They think, well, he must be one of my heroes, and I must have evidently gone to Bob Jones University. I did not. But what he says is so true, and it's easy to remember. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said once, God puts omnipotence back at his commands. He never asks you to do anything that you cannot do. The call to separation is a performable call. You say, nobody could live like that. Yes, they could. Nobody can enjoy life living like that. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. You can enjoy life. You can have a good time. It's a performable call. I haven't found it too difficult. Of course, I'm not a perfect being at all. But I haven't found it too difficult living for God. As a matter of fact, it's getting better every day. Getting sweeter and sweeter. And if I could go back and change it, I wouldn't change it. I've had folks feel sorry for me. Poor old Curtis. You don't know what it is to really get out and live. Why, he was saved when he was 11 years old and started preaching when he was 20. Why, he's never been out on the town. He doesn't know what it's all about. Oh, yeah. I know what it's all about. I deal with folks who've been out on the town and came back in off the town every week. I know what it is. I never woke up with a headache saying, oh, I've never had a hangover in my life. Never. Don't know what it is. I've seen other folks with ice packs on their heads. Night before, boy, we're having the best time. Next morning, oh. <laughs> Grown men. 
was with some men the other day, and I felt like I'd been dipped in the mire when I left. The language of grown men. I'm talking about men who, who've been to college and have degrees. I'm talking about businessmen, heads of companies. And using language, you'd think they'd never been to school. Little, cheap, silly, dirty, vulgar words. Grown men. I could expect some little kid in a country grammar school somewhere, down behind the bank during recess, writing something like that on the side of the bank. But a grown, intelligent man talking to other grown, intelligent men like imbeciles. Nuts. Idiots. Well, I'd have been to college and I got a better, a better vocabulary than that. I don't have to resort to that kind of speech. Separated. It's not only a personal call and a practical call, it's a performable call. You can do it. There's not a boy here, there's not a girl here, there's not a man here, there's not a woman here who cannot be a good, dedicated, separated Christian if you make up your mind to be one. Well, just for the record, I still think you ought to wear your dresses down to your knees. And I'll never get used to you wearing them six inches above your knees. I don't like it. If you can't afford to buy a longer dress, you ought to buy some burlap bags and sew them to the bottom of them. I can't get used to men using four-letter words. I don't like it. I can't get used to Christians living any kind of an old, loose life. And I want to keep on harping on it as long as I'm here. Somebody said, same old note, same old note. Yeah, same old note. It's like uh, George Whitfield said, he preached, you must be born again. He preached that same sermon, sermon 700 times in one city. So I went out to hear him and he said, I'm preaching today on you must be born again. And somebody said, well, why are you preaching again on you must be born again? He said, because there's still some people here who need to be born again. And I'm playing this same old note because I saw some skirts this morning. If you could call them skirts, they look more like long blouses to me. <laughs> you heard about the fellow who got lost in the grocery store and the grocery said, why didn't you hang on to your mother's coattail? He said, I couldn't reach it. Will Rogers said, what the world needs is dirtier fingernails and cleaner minds. And you can't keep cleaner minds when the women are going around dressed like they dress today. Not if you're a red-butted American and you're in good health. You say, well, not me. Your, your, your mind's in the gutter. And so is yours. We were all born with our minds in the gutters. That's what you call the sin nature. And that's why Jesus said, He that looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery within his own heart. He didn't say the, man, the woman that looks after a man to lust after him. But he said the man that looks after the woman. Because Jesus knew that women ought to dress modest so that men would not have the wrong desires toward them when he saw them. Simple, isn't it? And yet God expects it. It's a personal call, it's a practical call, it's a performed book call. You can do it. You can do it. I'm going to keep harping on it. I'm never going to be satisfied with that. That's why in the school we have dress standards here. And we're going to get stricter about them too. I can't help it if somebody comes along and says, I want my child in a private school, I'm going to put him out of the public school. I'm going to put him in the private school, but he's going to dress like I want him to dress. No, we can't have that. If we're going to have a Christian school, we've got to maintain a Christian atmosphere. Notice the other night at the banquet, a, a girl, must have been 11 years old, went up in the, bow, went up in the uh, 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 I guess you call it bleachers, what do you call it on the side, to sit, and three times I had to send someone to ask her to move. A mother sent her off like that. A dress on that would embarrass the most vulgar man in Atlanta. Well, we're a little different. 
God's called separation. We're going to maintain some standards. We may lose students. But as long as we can get the approval of God, I'd rather have his approval than students. We're not going to have boys with hair down to their neck, hanging down here looking like girls. They're going to look manly. Not my boy, I'll cut his hair like I want it. Then you don't send him over here to school. Because we want people around here to know that we believe different. You do like you want to, but don't force your convictions on me. And have folks visit the school and think that we tolerate that and we're for that. Separation is what I'm talking about. The Bible says men are not to be effeminate. Now we've got unisex. You can't tell which is which. The boys are wearing the tight pants now what the girls used to wear. Them. And you notice when they wear them, they sort of want to walk like a girl. <laughs> so help me in the airport about four weeks ago. A blonde-headed, one of the most beautiful blonde-headed girls I thought I'd ever seen went by. <laughs> and the fellow standing next to me, and both of us looked, and he whistled. <laughs> and I said, Amen. <laughs> and the fellow turned around <laughs> and looked at us. So help me, was a guy. But when I perform a marriage ceremony, I don't have to say whichever one you are, take whichever one this is, be whatever y'all are going to be. And would someone please kiss the bride? I won't be able to tell the difference. Separation, the call. Number two, the cost. Of separation. It costs something. You don't preach like this without hurting feelings. You don't preach like this without losing members sometimes. Because rather than people appreciating it and saying, thank God he showed me where I was wrong in the Bible and I'll get right, they rather just be like the rest of the world, just be like the crowd, whatever the crowd does all right with me. It's whatever the crowd does. You better watch out about the crowd. Farmer went out one night to shoot some crows. One day to shoot some crows in his cornfield, and he shot down through the bunch of crows in the cornfield, and several crows fell. And it just so happened that his parrot had been down in the cornfield too. His parrot had got loose, and he shot and wounded his parrot. And he got down there and there laid two or three dead crows and a wounded parrot. And he said, "Well, Polly, I didn't know you were here. What's wrong with you?" And the parrot said, "Ark, wrong crowd, wrong crowd, wrong crowd." <laughs> And you better get with the right crowd. Evil companions just corrupt good manners, or good, a good way of living. And he that walketh with wise men should be wise, but a companion of fools should be destroyed. That's Bible. You walk with good Christians. Yoke up with good Christians. Be with good Christians. People teach school here. I want them to teach school. And when the boys look at the fella, he can say, there's a guy. He can, he can imitate that man. I want him to have a man for a teacher. He's got a man. The cost of separation, it'll cost something. It hasn't been easy. I've been tempted to compromise a million times. And the further I go, the easier it would get to compromise. Because the people don't understand the issues always. And it's difficult to say, we'll do such and such without explaining the issue, and sometimes it takes hours to explain the issue. And all your people are not always present every time you preach, and they miss some of the issues that are explained. So when you take your stand, they don't know why you're taking it. And so rather than have misunderstanding, it's easy just to be quiet and say nothing. It costs something to be separated. But so far as I'm concerned, life is too short and eternity is too long for me to worry about gaining here. I'm concerned about gaining on the other side, not here. And the folks that misunderstood me here, if they're saved and we get to heaven, they'll understand me then. 
It costs something. In a heathen country, they were building a temple. And a man came by and noticed the gold and silver they were bringing. And he could tell by the, what had been started that the temple was going to be very expensive. And he asked an old lady, he said, How much is that temple going to cost? And she said, You don't ask what it's going to cost. We are building it for our gods. In the matter of separation, you don't ask what it's going to cost. You're doing it for a purpose. In another country, a missionary went by and he saw a man pulling a plow and another and his wife uh, holding the plow, plowing the field. And he inquired as to why the man was pulling the plow. And someone said, a few months ago said they were raising money to build a church. And this man had no money to give. And so he sold his ox and gave the money to the, build the church. And he has no ox. And now he's having to pull the plow. Would to God we had some people who would make that kind of a sacrifice to God. Heard Dr. Billings, the president of Howells Anderson College, tell this. It was told to me before I heard him tell it. Someone told me this. He went to the bank a few days ago and took out every dime he had. He had a few thousand dollars in savings. He took out every dime he had and put it into the Lord's work and said that I don't want the Lord to come and catch me away and, and leave several thousand dollars in that bank. I don't want a dime over there. If we were half as dedicated to the cause of Christianity and the salvation of sinners as the communists are in the spreading communism throughout the world, we could turn Atlanta upside down in 30 days. But we're not dedicated to it. The cost. It costs something. Not only the call and the cost, but now the, the compensation of separation it pays. wonder how Abraham's wife felt. He said, Honey, pack all the bags, put the furniture in some boxes, pack it all up, we're going to move it. Oh, Abe, have you bought a new home? No, I hadn't bought a new home. Oh, have you rented us a home somewhere? No, I hadn't rented a home. I see. We are moving. Yes, we're moving. Pack all the things. Get the china and silverware and get it all together. We're going to move. Uh, we're going to move uh, to the next county. I'm not sure what county we're moving to. We're just going to move. Oh. Are we moving to another state? I'm not sure if we're moving to another state or not. We're just going to move. Get everything packed. That's a good lesson for you women, by the way. Uh, well, maybe you could tell me this. Are we going, are you going north, north, north? Are you going north or south or east or west? But I don't know where I'm going north, south, east, or west. Just know I'm moving. Oh. How'd you like him and his wife? Packing your things to move and not even know where you're moving to. Loading up in the wagon, not even know which direction you're going. North, south, east, or west. The Bible said he went out not knowing where he was going. It cost him something. He had to give his membership in the Kiwanis Club. He had to pull his children out of the school they were in. He left every friend, left all his business and everything. It cost him something. But there was some compensation, though. God said, I'll tell you what you do now. You go. He said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. And he said, more than that, he said, I'm going to make you a blessing. 
And if you ever are used unto God to be a blessing, you'd rather be a blessing than have a blessing any time. I'm going to bless you. And he said, I'm going to make you a blessing. He said, I want to multiply your seed as the sand of the seas and as the stars in the heaven. I'm going to make out of you a great nation. And through your seed, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. It cost him an awful lot to say. One day God spoke to Sarah, 90 years old. He said, you're going to have a son. She laughed at it. God spoke to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, Isaac. And God gave him a son, Isaac. And Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And down through that lineage, you trace it all the way back, down through that lineage one day came Jesus. And the whole world was blessed through that seed, singular, Jesus. I'll bless you. And I'll make you a blessing. You can go to heaven without being separated, but you're not going to be a blessing to anybody else unless you're separated. David Brainerd prayed himself to death when he was 29 years old for the American Indians. Right here in America. You read the life and die of David Brainerd and it'll make you feel like you're a dirty bum. David Brainerd prayed from early in the morning to late at night prayed until he coughed his lungs out and died when he was 29 years old. It cost him something. But John Wesley read the life and diary of David Brainerd and got his candle lit. And John Wesley started the Methodist movement which resulted in the Methodist church. And all over America today there's building after building after building that are monuments to John Wesley who lit his candle reading the life and diary of David Brainerd. It cost him something but didn't it pay? There was some compensation. David Brainerd didn't live to see it. Payson read the life and diary of David Brainerd and began a prayer life that almost eclipsed Brainerd's. Payson prayed until there were grooves in the hardwood floors where his knees were nailed. He'd worn grooves in the hardwood floor. Robert Mary Mac Shane read it. Became a great missionary. Others read it. Say, there's some compensation to it. You know the churches that God's blessing across America are the churches you wouldn't expect, or at least the average person would expect. You take the top hundred Sunday schools in America, the largest attendances in Sunday school, and you check out, and they have requirements for their teachers. They're strict, and you'd think the very things they do would drive away the people, but it doesn't. It draws the people. The strictest churches in America are the largest churches in America. They have standards. They stick with them. It pays. It pays to be separated. I don't know about you, but my flag is nailed to the mask. I don't intend to go any other direction I'm going. If God would enlighten me on some things, I'd certainly change if I thought I was wrong. But I would not change for popularity's sake or friend's sake. When Abraham was called by faith, he went out into a country not knowing where he was going. Let us stand together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for the Word of God.